Well, hello and welcome to the third and final program in the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center series on the Catskills on the big and small screen. My name is Thorin Tritter. I am the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. Our program today fits into our broad goal to explore the culture of the Yiddish speaking world of Eastern Europe that the Nazis sought to destroy through the Holocaust but which survived and at least in some ways was transplanted to the United States. The Catskills, as I'm sure you know, became the most well-known vacation destination and summer retreat for the Yiddish speaking and other Jewish residents of the New York City area in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Before I go on to say more about our program this afternoon, let me put in a plug for a couple of our other upcoming activities, upcoming virtual programs, on Tuesday, March 23rd at 7 p.m., we're holding a baking demonstration with Chef Jake Cohen, who was recently on the cover of Hadassah Magazine. He's gonna be showing us how to bake his great aunt's kosher Passover meringue cookies. And next Wednesday, March 24th at 12 o'clock noon, I'll be giving my next Curator's Corner, which is uh, this month, presented in conjunction with Women's History Month. And so the program next week is gonna focus on a watercolor that stands in one of our galleries that was created by a child at the camp in Theresienstadt during the Holocaust. I'll be talking about the painting, how it fits into the larger context of the experiences of children during World War II. And one more program to mention, this coming Thursday at three o'clock, we are holding a new program, a virtual children's story time, which is designed for children three to seven years old. In this first program, Holocaust survivor Marie Taub will be reading the book, The Day the Crayons Quit. As always, you can find information about all these programs and all our larger schedule of programs on our website at www.hmtcli.org under the events tab. Okay, so let's talk about dirty dancing. At the end of February, we launched our series on the Catskills with a showing of an episode of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel which offered a depiction of the Catskills in 1959 in its heyday. Two weeks ago, we followed that up with a screening of the film Sweet Lorraine, a film that shows the Catskills in the 1980s when the area had lost some of its appeal. And today we are focusing on perhaps the best known film that takes place in the Catskills, Dirty Dancing. To help us compare and contrast Dirty Dancing with the other two depictions and to help us analyze this popular film, we're honored to have with us Dr. Linda Burkhardt, who's been studying the history of the Catskills and has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. Dr. Burkhardt is the scholar in residence here at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. She's written extensively for the New York Times, the New York Daily News, and Newsday, and her articles and essays have appeared in newspapers across the country and overseas. She has a PhD from Long Island University and is the author of three books, She's also has, she also has a personal connection to our topic as a native New Yorker, as the child of Holocaust survivors, and as someone who spent many summers in the Catskills when she was a child. I'm very pleased to welcome her again to our virtual stage to set up our program for this afternoon. Linda. So Dirty Dancing is a film that takes place in the Catskills, but it is not really about the Catskills. At heart, it's a love story. It's an iconic romance, it's a coming of age story, and in which an appealing young woman discovers two important passions in her life, one for a man and the other for dance. But underlying all of the action and romance is the fact that she, the way she grows into these two loves really could only take place in the Catskills. So the theme of the movie and the setting where it takes place are inextricably tied together. The film was made in 1987 when the Borscht Belt was in serious decline, but it takes place in 1963 when the Borscht Belt was in its heyday and thousands of vacationers flock there every summer. That year, 1963 is significant. So we can gain a deep understanding of the film if we think back to what life was like in the summer of 1963, an innocent time in American culture and history. So President Kennedy was still alive and wildly, widely admired, not by everyone, but by many, many. Um, America's stake in Vietnam had not yet become divisive, bitterly divisive as it became in the, the years to come. 
Martin Luther King Jr. had not made his, not yet made his soon to be famous I Have a Dream speech that would take place at the very, very end of the summer that year. And even the Beatles had not yet come to our shores. So dirty dancing can be seen as a fond goodbye to a comfortable, unconflicted American way of life before everything changed. And dubbed the ultimate summer movie, the film itself is undeniably upbeat and positive, designed to give us a lift, so to speak, um, an, opti an optimistic um, way that this genre um, presents itself and is supposed to be. So in some ways, between the 1963 love story and the rosy view of the future and the Jewish family that experiences it, the film can be seen as a kind of Yiddish inflected Camelot. So Dirty Dancing was said to be a takeoff of West Side Story. This was the very popular Broadway musical filled with flashy dancing that opened in 1957 and concerned a love affair between a young Italian American man and a newly arrived Puerto Rican ingenue. But the story in da Dirty Dancing was really the brainchild of a Jewish woman from Brooklyn named Eleanor Bergstein a woman who spent every summer of her life in the Catskills and was even called baby, like our heroine, until she was 20. That's who conceived the film and wrote the script. Bergstein's father was a doctor, just like babies, and much of the movie was based on her childhood and teen years at Grossinger's. She said that when her parents went off to play golf, she danced with the entertainment staff. For those of you who have seen Dirty Dancing, this will sound familiar. The soundtrack of Dirty Dancing, which won multiple awards, was taken from her collection of 45s. Now, instead of screening the entire film this afternoon, we've selected the top highlights of the movie, eight of them, to present to you. We couldn't find a way to get around the copyright issues in any legal way that made any kind of financial sense, so we're trying something new. The clips have been generously prepared by our colleague, Bill Taub, and he will screen them for us this afternoon. I'll introduce each clip, and then before we see the next one, I'll fill you in on what's happened in the story in between. The format is different from the others in our film festival, but I think you'll enjoy it. Although Dirty Dancing supposedly takes place at Grossinger's, the well-known upscale Catskill resort that Bergstein knew so well, it was really filmed in the exclusive Mountain Lake Lodge in Virginia, hundreds of miles south of the Catskills. The resort is huge and impressive, just as Kellerman's Mountain House in the movie is supposed to be. Other parts of the film uh, were made in Lake Lure, North Carolina, um, in Western North Carolina at a former Boy Scout camp and at the Lake Lure Inn. Both of these places offer dirty dancing weekends um, open to guests every summer to both celebrate and commemorate the film. And you can visit the places where the scenes in the movie were made. Grossinger's, however, closed the year before the film was released in 1986. Most of the action in Dirty Dancing takes place around the comings and goings of Baby Houseman, the young woman who is spending part of her summer between her high school graduation and the start of college at Mount, Mount Holyoke on a three week vacation with her parents and her sister. Baby is played by Jennifer Gray, daughter of the famous Oscar winning actor and dancer Joel Gray. Her love interest, Johnny Castle, is played by Patrick Swayze. He plays a tall, muscular dancer who comes from a working class Irish background. Baby's father, by contrast, is a slim, highly educated, conventionally liberal Jewish doctor. You can see right away how all of these class differences will create an invisible line between Baby and Johnny. And although it is dancing that allows them to cross the divide, it is the two different kinds of dancing we will see in the film that best portray the divisions between the two sub-societies at the hotel and by extent society in general. Two other characters who play important roles in the film are Cynthia Rhodes, who plays Penny, Johnny's sophisticated dancing partner, and Lonnie Price, who plays Neil Kellerman, the grandson of Kellerman's owner, Max, and the young man who pursues Baby, though without a great deal of success. Now, Dirty Dancing broke all sorts of records when it came out. The number of people who went to see it, the amount of money it brought in, the awards it won. What makes it so irresistible? One of the reasons for its immense popularity is that it was one of the few films that captured an authentic female perspective on the joys of first love. 
It also underlines the simple but important lesson that we need to treat all people with decency and respect. Although it was made in 1987, it is in some ways a very modern film as it presents the feeling of a class-free utopia that Baby and Johnny managed to usher in as both guests and staff are invited to rush onto the dance floor at the end. It also has an unusually vibrant soundtrack as you will hear and many of the songs actually have the word baby in their title or in their lyrics. The dancing was so vital and so captured viewers' imagination that enrollment was boosted at dance studios across America the year the film was released and everyone wanted to take dance lessons. Dirty Dancing is a movie about falling in love, but it's also about the push and pull of family dynamics and class, social status and wealth. And all of that is wrapped up in the, Cats, in the culture of the Catskill resorts and what they brought to society at the time. We'll talk about all these aspects and more after we've seen the clip. So pack your bags and pile into the family car for a trip to the Catskills with the Hausman family in the summer of 1963. We'll view our first clip together now called Welcome to Kellermans and watch them as they arrive at their destination for the start of their vacation. This is not a tragedy. A tragedy is three men trapped in a mine or police dogs used in Birmingham. Monks burning themselves in protest. Butt out, baby. Okay, we got horseshoes on the platform oh, yeah. in 15 minutes. We've got Stish Dash, the water class down by the lake. We have the still live art class. We got volleyball and croquet. For you older folks, we got sex. <laughs> So after the family settles in, Baby decides to look around. Peeking in at the door of the dining room, she overhears Max Kellerman, the owner, telling the Ivy League bound waiters to romance the guest's daughters, even the holy ones. When Johnny and some of the other entertainment staff come through, Max tells them harshly to keep your hands off the guests, no funny business, no conversation. Now we'll watch scene two called Dinner is Served. Ah. This is Dr. and Mrs. Hausman, baby, Lisa. This is your waiter, Robbie Gould. Yale Medical School. Uh-huh. Robbie, these people are my special guests. Give them anything they want. Enjoy. Thanks, Max. Oh, look at all this leftover food. Are there still starving children in Europe? Uh, try Southeast Asia, Ma. Robbie, baby wants to send her leftover pot roast to Southeast Asia. So uh, anything we don't finish, you wrap up. <laughs> Max, our baby's gonna change the world. So next, Max introduces his grandson, Neil, his assistant at the hotel and the heir apparent to the family, uh, implying that he would be a good match for baby. So Neil is quite conceited, though baby is polite, but not interested. Nevertheless, that evening, they dance together after dinner. Neil asks her about herself, and she says she plans to major in the economics of third world countries when she starts college in the fall. Baby is clearly bored with him. However, they dance and they watch. And eventually, two gorgeous people come onto the dance floor, and Baby wants to know who they are. Neil condescendingly tells her they are dance instructors at the hotel. Now we'll view a clip in which we'll watch a spectacular dance by Johnny and his partner, Penny. The name of this scene is called Mambo Magic. Oh, 
Oh, them. They're the dance people. They're here to keep the uh, guests happy. off with each other. That's not gonna sell lessons. Later in the evening, Baby walks off by herself and follows the sound of some very attractive rock and roll coming from a building behind the main house. She peeks inside. She sees Johnny and Penny and the rest of the entertainment staff dancing with great abandon, doing a forbidden wild dirty dance at a staff party. She tries to join them, but looks and feels out of place. She dances hesitantly with Johnny and she's never, because she's never done anything like this before. The next night, Neil brings her to the hotel kitchen for a midnight snack, and she hears somebody crying in the corner. It's Penny, and she ditches Neil and rushes to tell Johnny. Penny is crying because she just found out she is pregnant and can't afford an abortion. So Baby asks her father for the money. He gives it to her with some questions, and she brings it to Penny. The only night the abortionist will be in town is on Thursday, the day that Penny and Johnny have a, a paid gig at a nearby hotel. Baby, despite the fact that she knows nothing about dancing, volunteers to take her place. Johnny is very skeptical. However, we will now watch a scene where Johnny begins to teach her to dance to get her ready for the performance. The scene is called Feeling the Music. Oh, no. sorry. Don't step on the one. You gotta start on the two. Find the two, you understand? I told you I never did any of these dances before. Now it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now the music starts, you don't dance till the two. You got it? Yes. Relax. Relax. Breathe. Bring. Nope. Ow. Two, three, four, two, three, four, don't lean back, lifting up, two, three, four, shoulders down, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four, two, three, four. Again, a concentrate. And Put your heel down. I Just didn't. stay on the I... toe. Just listen to me. The steps aren't enough. Feel the music. on 
number one is not the mambo. It, it's a feeling, a, a heartbeat. It's good. Well, baby and Johnny practice and practice and practice. And miraculously, the performance goes really well. Penny comes back from her abortion, though, in pain and in an emergency situation. So baby calls her father, who comes and helps her and makes the incorrect assumption that Johnny is the father and looks at him with disdain and disrespect. As baby and her father leave the staff residence in the middle of the night, baby's father tells her that she's forbidden to have anything to do with the dancers ever again. But later that night, baby goes to Johnny to apologize for her father's treatment of him. They talk, they dance, they kiss, and you know what happens next. Baby sneaks back home later on in the night, but she doesn't get caught. The next morning she visits Penny and she finds out that Penny is so much better. Then she goes to Johnny and their romance grows. So now we'll view the next clip, aptly called Lover Boy. So Neil is in the dance studio now with the couple and he and Johnny argue about how to plan for the last dance of the last show of the season. And Johnny's ideas, all of his ideas are spurned. Neil is very condescending. Then baby and Johnny go outside and they see her sister and her dad walking with Robbie, the handsome waiter who is going to be a med student at Yale. And they drop down and they hide in the bushes. Baby and Johnny have their first fight. He wants her to tell her parents that she's seeing him, but she's not ready. At dinner that night, Max Kellerman tells the family there's been a theft, a guest's wallet is stolen, and they accuse Johnny, who insists he was home all night. But there's no one to vouch for that. Then Baby speaks up tremulously and says he does indeed have an alibi, her, as, he was, as she was with him all night. Baby's dad is aghast. She tries to explain, but he won't listen. Johnny finds her later and tells her they found the thief, but he's been fired anyway for getting involved with her. And now he has to leave the resort. Baby cries, it was all for nothing. But Johnny says, no, no one has ever spoken up for me in my life. I've never before met a person who would do that. Now I've met someone who is who I want to be. Finally, they say goodbye and he drives off. So now we'll see the next scene, the final show called The End of Summer. I've shared another season's talent, play, and fun. Summer days will soon be over, soon the autumn starts. And tonight the memories whisper softly in our hearts. Joy in hands and hearts and voices.
me. Good luck in medical school, sir. And I wanted to thank you for your help with the penny situation. Because we've all gotten into messes like these. What? I thought baby told you. Look, I'm not sure. I mean, Penny said so, but you know with girls like that, they're liable to pin it on any guy around. Now, you'll notice at this final show that Johnny is not there. The scene now shifts to Max Kellerman and Tito Suarez, the old band leader, standing on the side of the stage while the performance is going on. Now, let's see what they say to each other in this clip entitled, Where Have All the People Gone? Tito, we've seen it all, huh? Baba and Zeta serving the first pasteurized milk to the borders. Through the war years when we didn't have any meat, through the depression when we didn't have anything. Lots of changes, oh Max, lots of changes. It's not the changes so much this time, Tito. It's, it's that it all seems to be ending. You think kids want to come with their parents to take foxtrot lessons? Trips to Europe, that's what the kids want. 22 countries in three days. Feels like it's all slipping away. And the singing goes on. Now we'll watch what happens when the back door to the ballroom is suddenly flung open. This scene is called Last Dance. Nobody puts baby in a corner. Sorry about the disruption, folks. But I always do the last dance of the season. This year, somebody told me not to. So I'm going to do my kind of dancing with a great partner, who's not only a terrific dancer, but somebody who's taught me that there are people willing to stand up for other people, no matter what it costs them. Somebody who's taught me about the kind of person I want to be. Miss Frances Housen. Sit down, Jake. Now I had the time of my life. No, I never felt like this before. Yes, I swear. It's a truth, and I owe it all to you. Cause I've the time of my life, and I owe it all to you. I've been waiting for so long, now I finally found someone to stand by me.
So that was our last clip. And I have to tell you, the very end um, is the very last 30 seconds of the movie is that baby's dad goes over to Johnny and says, I was wrong. And when I'm wrong, I say so. Johnny accepts his apology and feels accepted and empowered. Baby and her dad embrace and she's forgiven and all is well. Linda, thanks so much for giving us that uh, summary of the film with those clips. Um, I apologize for my computer glitch, which didn't enable me to, to welcome everybody and to introduce you appropriately. But thank you, Linda, for picking up the pieces and making it work so smoothly. Sure. Uh, I want to thank everybody out there and encourage you, if you have questions for Linda about this film, this is obviously a film that I think many of you probably have seen. And so these clips are perhaps reminders, but uh, there's much more to the film, as Linda suggested with her uh, with her summaries. But if you have questions, of course, uh, please type them in the Q&A button and we'll make sure that Linda has time to respond to them. Linda, I, I really thought your, your summary was great. And I have to admit those clips, some of them make me smile. They are iconic. They really, that's, they, I think they did a good job. I hope they did a good job at capturing the, the film. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about a question that we've talked about with regard to the other films as well. And that is, uh, and you you touched a little on this, I think, at the beginning. What's distinctively uh, distinctive about the Catskills in this film? You said it could have taken place. I mean, it was filmed elsewhere. So what's distinctive about the Catskills here? It's very interesting. The, the, the word Catskills is never mentioned. And the family is never described as being Jewish. And yet we know it takes place in the Catskills and the family is Jewish. It's, it's very hard to explain exactly why, but the scenario there, the setup, the physical setup of the, the grounds, the hotel, the um, activities, um, Max Kellerman, certainly when he welcomes them, gives an aura of you are in a Jewish environment with other Jews, we welcome you and you belong here. And that's a very Catskill issue. That's one of the reasons that when the Catskills declined, there was a big question as to why do Jews not need to be together anymore? So the, the level at which the people interact, the um, Ivy League aspirations of all of the waiters, all of this is very much like the Catskills. The, the, the class divides, they're a little bit overdone because it's a movie, but the guests are one level. The, um, the, the staff is aspiring to be at that level and the entertainment people, we don't see kitchen staff in this at all, but the entertainment staff are at a whole other level in terms of society and uh, class, wealth and social status. I, I wanna turn to a number of the things that you just said. I think they open up a bunch of different questions. Um, I, I thought in seeing that, I've watched the film a couple of times in preparation for this program. And the thing that one of the, the few scenes that really struck me as distinctively Catskillian is that scene that you showed toward the second to last scene that you showed where Kellerman is talking to the band leader and actually speaks Yiddish. There might be, mm -hmm. There's a couple of phrases of, of Yiddish in there that, um, that he gets to. But he also talks in that clip about the end of the Catskills. And this is 1963, as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, and he talks about the airfare and, and people going to Europe and stuff. Are those the things that were on people's minds in 1963? Or is that is that a kind of later view that's being put back onto this film? 
Yeah, I don't think it was there in 1963 unless people really were able to look ahead at the world, but I doubt it because the, the setup for the film, uh, the, the choice of that year, when you look at, as I said in my introduction, the way the world is, you know, we weren't bitterly divided over Vietnam and President Kennedy was still alive and the world was one big Camelot, a Yiddish inflected Camelot. I don't know if you saw the introduction because you might've been off, but um, so I think since the movie was made in 1987, when the, the whole drop had happened, it was the producers and the directors um, imposing a little bit of the future on 1963. It wasn't there yet. It was a clever, it was a clever um, uh, a trick to do that. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you know, you, you also said at the beginning, and you just mentioned it, that the, the, one of the main themes that's running through this is class division. Mm -hmm. um, and but the and the particularly between the the entertainers that we see versus the guests and then the wait staff at least in this film are suggested as from good Jewish families they were they're kind of mm -hmm. the they they seem to fit in much more and I'm wondering if that was an accurate depiction you know in in Sweet Lorraine uh, we see a, much more about the kitchen staff and the waiters they don't seem to be in that film the same Jewish community and medical students and things like that. Maybe I'm wrong, but anyway, so what's your thinking? Is that depiction of the wait staff that we see here and the other class divisions, is that appropriate? Mm -hmm. I do think so. This hotel is at a higher level than, suite, than the Lorraine Hotel. The Lorraine Hotel used uh, largely locals, uh, local kids for their kitchen staff. They didn't really have an entertainment staff. They had the, the one Tumler, um, who went from hotel to hotel, and I'm sure during the winter found Yiddish type places to work. But um, the, the staff at this hotel, this is a very top notch hotel. You know, this is like saying this represents the Catskills, like Fifth Avenue represents New York City. And so these waiters are not going to be waiters their whole lives. These waiters are looking for connections and um, they're working at a high end hotel as they go to their good colleges. And so it's, uh, yes, I do think it's, it's, it's correct in terms of the entertainment staff. If you think back to 1963, the kind of dancing that they were doing, it wasn't there yet in the mainstream, but it was being done in people's basements. It did exist, but it wasn't out in the open yet. And so these are kids who have a different kind of life. And so, yes, the class divisions they do make sense. Um, yeah, when you talk about this this hotel as we see it in this film as being on the high end, it does remind me of the of the the resort that we see in the marvelous Mrs. Maisel episode mm -hmm. that we watched also, where mm -hmm. it's a, a high end and there's some people are in houses like the Housemans in this case. Uh, so it did remind me of that that same genre of hotel. Mm -hmm. Somebody somebody is asking here about what's your favorite Catskill resort and why. Uh, and maybe you could talk more broadly about the different, the range of Catskill resorts that were out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, mine personally was the Concord. I just love the Concord. I just found it a, a, a playland, um, just offering a great deal of fun. When I went there, I was very young and I had no sense of who was who or why they were there. I just enjoyed it. And the range of hotels in the Catskills truthfully ranges from all the way at the upper level of the Concord and Grossinger's um, all the way down to the original boarding houses. As we saw in Sweet Lorraine, Sweet Lorraine, uh, the, the Lorraine Hotel started in 1906 and was run all those generations and all those decades. It started as a boarding house where people came in and had very inexpensive accommodations. Um, and the ones, the people with a little bit more money were able to go to the bungalow colonies people who liked the social aspect of living kind of in the pocket of your neighbors because they were neighbors they had a lot in common with. So they were very comfortable. It was like extended family. And those who didn't want that quite, um, uh, I don't know, non-private living arrangement would move up to the smaller hotels that, were, that provided meals and um, recreation, but not at the level, the glitzy, fancy, elegant level of Grossinger's and the Neville and um, those kinds of, that level of place. Um, I know you touched on this earlier, but I just want to ask you about it again as well, which is, you said that the hotel, the actual physical hotel that's used for this filming, 
it was a couple of different hotels, hotels, but none of them were located in the Catskills. Does that in any way undermine the effectiveness of showing what's supposed to be the Catskills? No, because in 1986 and 1987, when this movie was being made, the really big, beautiful hotels weren't operating. So Grossinger's had already closed and um, the Concord closed later, but it was, it was nowhere near the level that they show in this movie at that time. And the same with Butchers and with the Neville. So they really couldn't have done that. They found a beautiful, fancy hotel and shot the films, the, did the filming there. Now, that was only the outside. The, the um, uh, Mountain Hotel in Virginia did not want to let them in because they didn't want to ruin their summer guests' time. So the inner shots were mainly done in, in uh, North Carolina at the Boy Scout camp and the smaller Lake Lure Resort. And those white fences where Baby is practicing, they, are, they were taken from one location to the next to make it look like she did everything at one place. I love that scene where she stomps her foot and kicks the <laughs> fence and stuff. Yeah, um, you know. So I've been asking you a couple of questions about specific parts of Dirty Dancing and their historical accuracy. But overall, does this film give us a a, a good depiction of what the Catskills was like in 1963? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. People were there to enjoy themselves. Nobody was running off to have intellectual discussions or save the world. Um, Baby implies that that's what she's going to do when she gets older. Uh, she says at one point after college, she wants to join the Peace Corps, which had just been started two years before by President Kennedy. Uh, but everyone else there who's a guest is just there for fun. And the staff is working to, to give them what they want. And some of what they want is the class division based on wealth and status. The guests there earned the money to be there and they want to enjoy themselves. And the people who are on the staff are there to make sure that happens. Uh, somebody posed a question or a comment really about the father, who uh, I always think is the detective from Law and Order, <laughs> Law and Order uh, right. or my wife thinks is uh, Lumiere from Beauty and the Beast, but mm -hmm. uh, a lovely guy. And <laughs> and uh, so the, the comment is that the father's interesting because he, he seems to have liberal moments at times, particularly when he's helping Penny, uh, but and his liberal remarks, like at the very opening scene that you showed. But when it comes to his daughter, he's far more conservative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she, he doesn't want her hanging out with the help, as you said. Um, and so I'm just wondering if you would, if you're, what your thoughts are about his character. Is that an uh, appropriate character or depiction of a perhaps liberal Jewish father in the 1960s? Um, what do you take from his character? Sadly, I think it is. Uh, Baby has a very interesting remark at one point where she says to him, you taught me that you have to treat people well and treat everybody equally, but you didn't tell me that what you meant was everybody who's like us. And I think that really sums it up. There was a distinct lack of awareness of class differences among most people. And I think he's perfectly sincere and kind and a warm, wonderful person, but he's narrow. He doesn't know it. The world hasn't yet taught him that he needs to look outside himself. Yeah. Um, I want to change topics a little. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about some common threads that might exist or might not exist between these three different depictions of the Catskills that we've watched over the, mm -hmm. the past month or so. And one that seems to jump out at me is romance. Uh, obviously, this is a major part of Dirty Dancing, uh, also of Sweet Lorraine. And, and then even in the episode from The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, we saw Midge getting set up on a date and uh, there's, and so my question is this, is that, what the, is that what the Catskills was like? Is this, was a big part of going to the Catskills, dating, meeting people, maybe creating relationships that would become marriages? How, what's going on there? Okay, so yes, people did meet at the Catskills and get married, it certainly happened. But all of those romances, that's not the Catskills, that's Hollywood. The Catskills were very family oriented, and that was part of what was so wonderful. We have to think about 1963 and how close it was to the end of World War II. And the great heyday of the Catskills in the 50s and 60s were really about happiness that the war was over, happiness for the Jews that we were here, we had money, we survived, we had children, we were part of a family. And that's what was going on at the Catskills. 
Well, thanks, Brent. Yeah, thanks for bringing that back up. That mm -hmm. there is a real connection, and that's why we did this series to begin with, right? There is a real connection between the Catskills and the Holocaust, mm -hmm. and that this is a, a place that became the resort for the survivors and their descendants, and was very much a reaction to and a response mm -hmm. to overcoming the Holocaust, at least in some way. Mm -hmm. Um, as somebody points out that the Catskills were a very safe place for kids, I think which you're also saying. Yes. Uh, they're also pointing out that um, parents often are more protective of daughters to keep them close, but maybe uh, stereotypically push their sons out into the world in a different way. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's true for everybody, but we seem to be seeing that, at least a part of that in this film. Um, I wanted to ask you one other a different question, which is, I, I think you touched on this in a previous episode of our programs, but I think it's worth going back to, and that is what's going on in the 1980s, and particularly 1987, to have two films, Sweet Lorraine and Dirty Dancing, come out. It's not like we see, you know, numbers of films coming out about the Catskills in the 1970s or in the 2000s. So what's going on in the 1980s at least somewhat, to explain why we've got these two films that come out of a very few number that mm -hmm. come out in the same year. Mm -hmm. Well, the answer is very simply a lot of bankruptcy. There was a shocking, quick decline in the Catskills, a drop, and it was a tremendous change. And everything that had been built up there in the 50s and the 60s was lost. It started disappearing by the even early mid 70s when the world changed so much. And by the mid eighties, gone, just shockingly painfully gone. And I think that that's what's, the, that was behind the reason for this. In, in Sweet Lorraine, we certainly see that they deal with the decline and they're being nostalgic about trying to document what things were like in, in the hotels. And in this movie, this is kind of a fantasy. Let's go back 25 years and we'll pretend that everything was easy and fun. In a lot of ways, it was because people weren't dealing with the horrors that had happened a couple of decades before. And they were not yet in that period of awareness of everything that was wrong with the time now. And I think that's, that's what it was. Very surprising the two movies came out at the same time. Yeah, very that's different funny. movies. Very different. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it, that, it, there was that that big moment of transition and change in the Catskills that made people spark, made some movie people say, let's let's at least get some of this depiction. Uh, mm -hmm. There's something to talk about here. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'm gonna put you on the spot and ask you about themes that run through these three uh, moving image depictions that we've seen. What, what Other than romance, which we talked about, what's another theme that you see as coming through in these different depictions? I think um, an important one is the relationship of Jews to each other and the tremendous need for a sense of belonging and for a sense of safety among themselves and a bond binding together. It's actually in all three movies. And in all three movies, there's a woman who, a young woman who is attracted to a man who might not be Jewish. Now in Sweet Lorraine, um, Maureen Stapleton tells Trini Alvarado, you know, he's not Jewish. And in this movie, it's clear how dad feels about Patrick Swayze. And in, in Mrs. Maisel, she talks about, um, uh, Midge talks about dating. And her mother says, well, you know, what about your friends, you know, Marthy, Martha, Molly, I'm not sure what her name was. And, and she said, oh, no, 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 she's not Jewish. She doesn't, have, doesn't know anybody Jewish for me to go out to. So that's there in all three. And this sense of bonding and of safety in numbers and in a larger sense, explaining why Jews tend to live in cities rather than in rural areas because they wanna be around other Jews. And that's, that's a major theme of all three of these films. Wow, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, as you look at the three depictions, which comes across to you as the most accurate, or maybe that's an unfair question and they're all accurate in different ways, but how do you compare them? Well, all accurate and all inaccurate. <laughs> so the bottom of the heap is Mrs. Maisel. Now, part of that is that it is made with a, the longest lens in terms of time. 
So the people who made Mrs. Maisel weren't at the Catskills. They probably weren't even a twinkle in their father's eye yet at when, in, when the Catskills were, um, you know, were, were uh, in its heyday. Um, so I would say that one is the least realistic of all. It's the whole uh, series is vaguely ironic and somewhat of a character of life anyway. Um, Sweet Lorraine was realistic, um, without a doubt. And um, Dirty Dancing, somewhat, but it's more realistic on the level of um, how, how things are gonna change. Not so much for Jews in particular, because Jewish life at that time was fine and was getting bigger and better. Uh, as one of the reasons the Catskills declined was that Jews were welcome elsewhere and were, it was much easier to get a job if you were Jewish in the 70s than it had been in the 60s. And it was easier to get into good colleges. The quotas were supposedly gone if they still existed at the time they were hidden. Um, but they, it was much easier. Life was much more open. So um, very different times for, for all three of them, very different ways of looking at the world. Um, I'm going to jump to a couple of questions that have come in or comments that I wanted to get your response to. Uh, one person says that uh, she was working at a Jewish camp as a counselor, uh, I guess in the 1970s, it seems like, and she remembers those same economic class and, mm -hmm. um, and concerns about those issues that existed then. But then she says the receiving of tips as a reward for following the rules and meeting the expectations of the hotel owners, that was that was kind of the the big reward, mm -hmm. and so how much of the the tipping, uh, how much was that a part of going to the Catskills? This this um, tipping the various staff who'd been serving you for your week or month or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, tipping was a big deal, definitely, and the um, the hotel counted on it, so the wages were lower than they might have been because. Uh, they knew that tipping would happen. And we see that scene with Robbie where, you know, Jake gives him the tip and then takes it back when he finds out, oh, you're just an awful sleazy person. You know, I, I'm not tipping you. So that, that was definitely very important. And part of that also is that, you know, in at least in Dirty Dancing in 1963, um, you know, Jews were becoming more affluent and were proud of their affluence. And so being able to tip somebody um, was was an important thing. It, it was not only a nice thing to do for the person receiving the tip, but it felt good for the person who was able to provide the tip. Ah, yes, very nice to say. Um, another question that's come in is about singles weekend in particular at the Concord in the early 60s. And to what degree was that um, an important part of that hotel, those singles weekends? Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely an important part. Um, it's not something that's uh, that I would think anyone would ever make a movie about because that could happen anywhere. That's not in any way specially endemic to the Catskills, but that was definitely a big deal. Um, part of it was that the hotel wanted to invite young people who would meet, get married, have children, and come back as families to these hotels. I'm just, I know that there's been a whole lot of comments about people who met each other at these singles weekends or met each other at the Catskill. So that's a whole stream that we are, <laughs> we are uh, seeing in our comments. So uh, fit, fits in very much with what you're saying. Um, I, we're running up to an hour and I think we should start to wrap it up. And I wanna thank you, Linda, for these three programs that we've done and the, just all your insights that you've shared. And I wanna give you a chance to give us some things. Maybe I haven't been asking the right questions, but. What strikes you about these three films that we've seen or these three depictions and what makes them important? Hmm. Oh, well, you know, they say a lot about Jewish life in um, the earlier decades and they talk a lot. I think they show us a lot about the development of um, uh, Jewish awareness. Uh, you know, one of the tenets of Judaism is social justice, which is a very big deal today. And we hardly see it at all in, in um, let's say, Dirty Dancing in way back in the 60s when I think people were uh, taking care of themselves before they realized that the world at large needed them to take care of things also. 
So that's something that's, um, I think, something that comes through with these films. And it's a very important issue. Um, well, it has hit two o'clock. I think we should wrap it up. Uh, I want to thank you for all your guidance, Linda. Uh, I want to thank Bill for working behind the scenes, Bill Taub, to make our documentary or, or our film screenings work. And I want to thank the audience for joining us. I hope that you will find us at other uh, virtual programs that HMTC is organizing. And you can always find more information on our website at www.hmtcli.org. Thanks, everybody, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.